He's standing at the back of the crowd. He's got his long robe on, long flowing robe. And truth be told, it's too hot to be wearing a robe like this. But he likes the attention that it brings. He likes to walk down the streets and to be greeted, Rabbi, Rabbi, how are you? Rabbi, I have a question. Rabbi, I need some guidance. He takes God's word quite literally. He reads in Deuteronomy chapter 6 about how you're supposed to bind God's word upon, the, upon your heart and to bind it upon your forehead. So he wears a phylactery, a box that has God's word right here in the middle of his forehead between his eyes. Again, it's about calling attention to himself. It's about playing a part. It's about putting on a mask and being the way he want, being perceived the way he wants people to perceive him. So there he is standing at the back, listening to this traveling rabbi, this preacher, and there's disdain in his heart, and his arms are crossed, and his teeth are clenched, his jaw is tight. And he's taking note of every single one of his so-called followers that are there listening to this other rabbi teach. And he's going to call them to the carpet in just a few moments. You see, this guy is one of those guys who he has a critical spirit and he's constantly watching other people to see how he can bring some sort of accusation against them. Maybe you know that kind of a person. Do you know someone like that? He's always trying to find the fault first before he tries to find the promise or the potential in anyone. He's trying to tear them down before he builds them up. And the whole reason for it is because deep down inside, his self-esteem is pretty low. He's a pretty small person when he really looks into the mirror and he's honest with himself. And so he tears people down because he feels like in some way it builds himself up. And so he's there at the back of the crowd watching all of his followers being attracted to this man, Jesus, who's preaching truth, who's preaching with authority, authority that he's never experienced the words seem to roll off his tongue and seem to pierce people's hearts, and he's jealous, he's envious, he's wishing that he had the attention of the crowd, but he doesn't, because he's lesser of a man. And he hears these words in Matthew chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, open it up, Matthew chapter 7. Jesus says this, he says, judge not that you may not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with which, what, with which measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but don't consider the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First remove the plank from your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and, turn, and in turn tear you to pieces. Now pause there. Jesus begins this portion. Actually, he's continuing this portion. The man begins to listen for the very first time, and the first words that he hears are, Judge not, lest you be judged. Avoid a critical spirit, he hears. And again, put yourself in this religious leader's shoes because if we're honest with ourselves, we probably relate to this person more than we would like to admit, especially if you've been in church for a while, especially if you've been raised in church, especially if you've listened to sermon after sermon, Bible study after Bible study, you've been to prayer meeting after prayer meeting, eventually you start looking at the people coming in off the street who are new in their faith, who are just beginning their walk with Jesus, and you have preconceived notions about who they are, don't you? You assume because they dress a certain way, or they wear their hair a certain way, or their family behaves a certain way, that you know exactly what their story is. And immediately you enter into the same shoes that the Pharisee is as he's listening to Jesus, watching all of these people, casting judgment, being critical, trying to find fault, trying to tear people down. And the reason for it is because if you can tear them down, you're building yourself up. You see, my friends, if, if you don't have to tear somebody down, it means you're doing pretty well with where you're at spiritually, but if you have the need to constantly and consistently destroy people, even in your own thinking, assuming you know who they are, assuming you know what it's like in their homes, assuming you know how they live their lives and how they, how they watch over their children and what kind of marriage they have and what kind of job they have, 
You tear and you tear and you tear and you break and you break and you break because deep down inside, you're trying to find a way to justify yourself. Listen carefully to me. You do not need to justify yourself. I'll go a step further than that. You are incapable of justifying yourself before a holy God. Jesus is the one who justifies. Jesus is our redeemer. Jesus is the one who paid the price that we could not pay. And so here, the, the, Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. And in the Greek, this word means to judge to the point of condemnation. And there's a difference between trying to be discerning, trying to look at, at a situation and discerning what's happening there, and casting judgment to the point of condemnation. There isn't a single one of us in this room who are able to judge another person that way. We, can, we are not the judge. We are not the jury. God alone is the judge and jury. We do not judge to the point of condemnation. And if we are, are looking at somebody and judging them in that way, what Jesus is saying is you need to be careful because as you do that, you need to understand with what, what measure you're using, that's the same yardstick that God is going to use to measure your holiness and your righteousness and your lifestyle. Are you ready to be judged the way you're judging other people? Is what Jesus says. That's a scary thought, isn't it? Truth be told, are we the ones who break down and tear down because we're trying to build ourselves up? Because we're the man standing at the back listening with our arms crossed and our teeth clenched. No personal holiness. No righteousness. We're going through the motions. We're punching the clock. We're here at 10 o'clock on Sunday. We leave. You, you want to leave at 11.30, but it never happens. <laughs> You're here on Wednesday night. Jump from time to time, Bible study to Bible study, sermon to sermon, but you're never getting anything out of it because you're not really growing. That's what this guy's like. And Jesus says to that man as he would say to us, be careful. You need to stop judging. You need to stop having that critical spirit and that critical heart. You need to stop trying to find fault in other people, and you need to start trying to find promise in other people. You need to start looking through your eyes the way Jesus looks through his eyes at people because he doesn't see a life that's destroyed. He sees the glory that he can have by putting it back together. There isn't a single person in this room that God cannot use to bring himself glory if you'll surrender to his plan. Your life might be broken in shambles and in pieces right now today, but God wants to do something in and through you. God wants to use you. He'll put those pieces back together. If you commit your walk to him, if you commit that broken heart to him, he will mend you and he will set you up on a pedestal. He'll set you up at this pulpit so that you can bring God glory so that men will look at your life, what your life used to be and say, wow, if God can do that for him, he can do it for me. Judge not, lest you be judged. Stop condemning other people, or you yourself are in danger of being condemned. That's what Jesus is saying. Listen, my friends, you might be here today, and you might not be really walking in the fullness of the forgiveness that God has to offer you. Here's the truth, and here's the promise of God's word, that there isn't anyone in this room who has to experience God's judgment. Let me tell you what God's judgment looks like. God's judgment looks like a cross. It looks like a man being taken in the middle of the night and bound and beaten across his face and mocked, spit upon. God's judgment looks like taking him, dragging him to a place where he either has to confess or be whipped, and he's whipped 39 times with nine leather strips with glass and bone and pottery embedded into those straps, so much so that it, the scripture says that, that his, he's, he's marred beyond recognition. You can't even recognize who Jesus is as he experiences God's wrath and God's judgment in your place. God's judgment looks like being taken from that flogging station and being strapped to a board to a wooden cross and being forced to carry it to your own place of crucifixion. God's judgment looks like a man collapsing under the weight and the stress and the pressure of the cross, the weight of the sin barreling down upon his shoulders, the weight of your bad choices and my bad decisions being poured upon him, poured out in God's fury and in God's wrath with that cup that God pours out on Jesus. There it is, the weight of it, and he collapses under 
the stress of our sin being judged in our place. God's judgment looks like being put up upon that cross, wrists and feet pierced through. Pulling up on the cross, pulling up on the wrists and on the feet in order to breathe. The pressure must have been excruciating. Every time he pulls up and he pushes up with his wrists and he pushes up with his feet, his open back from all of the flogging, scraping upon the splintery cross on the way up and on the way down. On the way up and on the way down. God's judgment looks like the earth becoming dark. For three hours, there isn't light to be seen. As God turns his face and takes his light away, as all of the judgment is being poured out upon his son. God's judgment also looks like a veil in the temple being torn from top to bottom. Access into God's presence and into God's throne room. there, available for all to receive if they'll just believe that that place on the cross belonged to me. See, you don't have to be condemned. Jesus was condemned in your place. Jesus went to the cross that had your name on it. Above the cross says, King of kings and Lord of lords, but it should have been my name. It should have been your name. But he hung there in my place. And he bore the wrath of God. He took upon himself the judgment of God. And the scripture says this, that as he was there, as he was being judged for my choices and my decisions, it says this in Isaiah chapter 53. It says, he has borne our griefs and he's carried our sorrows. Listen. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he, wo- he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we've been healed. He was the one who bore our griefs. He was the one who carried my sorrow. He was the one who was wounded for my transgression. He was the one who was bruised for my iniquity. He was the one who had the chastisement, the appeasement, the punishment for my sin placed upon his back. And it was so heavy that he fell to the ground because he couldn't carry it any further. But he still found his way to the cross. The place where God's access is met. Where where we are once again able to come into God's presence. The veil is torn. Access for you and I. No longer in a place of judgment. No longer are we in a place of condemnation. God says come into my presence. My friend you do not have to experience condemnation this morning. I don't care what kind of sin you walk through those doors with. I don't care how foul and festering that sin looks in your eyes. I don't care what other people think about it. I don't care how taboo it is to talk about it. I don't care how ashamed you are when you came in. You do not have to pay the price for that sin. Jesus paid the price in full upon the cross. And he says, if you'll just believe, if you'll just believe, you don't have to be condemned. You don't have to be judged like that. Listen, Jesus gives this invitation in Matthew chapter 11. And this is the goodness of our God. This is the goodness of our Savior, our Messiah. His name is Jesus. He says this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Anyone feel tired? Feel a heavy load? Do you feel the weight of sin? Are you trying to bear the weight of sin yourself? Are you frustrated because you feel like you can't carry it any further? Are you at your wit's end? Have you exhausted all of your strength and all of your resources? My friends, it doesn't matter. I know there's regret. I know you feel bad about what you did with your children or about how your children lived through your sin. You drug them through the mud with you. I understand that. But Jesus' invitation to you this morning is come to me if you feel like you're heavy laden. Come to me if you're tired of carrying around that guilt and that regret and that shame and that sin. Come to me if you labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, learn from me for I'm gentle, I'm lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's his invitation to you this morning, you who struggle. 
He says, come to me, lay down that weight. Don't you see? He says, I've already bored the weight of that sin. I already suffered in agony and died. I breathed my last. I gave up my spirit so that you don't have to carry that around anymore. I don't want that to be your burden. I don't want that to be your life. I don't want that to be your heaviness. I don't want that to take away your breath. I don't want that to take away your vitality. Come to me if you labor and are heavy laden. Give it over to me. Give it to me. I've already taken it to the cross. My friends, you don't have to suffer for your sins this morning. The scripture says this in Romans chapter 8. I love this. It says this. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. The law was given to tell us how to live with God, how to live a life for God. But it was incomplete. It wasn't able or capable of doing what God needed it to do. It was weak through the flesh, through our flesh. But God did do it by sending his own son in the likeness of simple flesh on the account of sin. Listen to this. He condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Jesus sent his Son to condemn sin in the flesh. He came to receive that judgment. He came to receive that condemnation so that you wouldn't have to suffer through that. We couldn't do it. We were too weak, the scripture says. We were weak. The law tried to do this, but the, the flesh was weak. We couldn't obtained or we couldn't live up to that standard so God had to make another way and he did make another way and the way that he made was by sending his son to live a perfect spotless life and to die a sacrificial death that you and I deserve so that we wouldn't have to be condemned that should give us hope you do not have to be condemned this morning You see, this word that he's giving now, and this Pharisee's hearing, judge not lest you be judged. The moment you come to understand that Jesus was condemned in your place, how can you possibly think that you should stand in the seat of judgment yourself? How can you possibly think that you are holy enough or righteous enough to pass judgment on another human being when you realize and you understand what it cost Jesus so that you wouldn't have to be condemned? Why would you ever want to stand in that place yourself? Judge not, lest you be judged. John 3, 16, everybody memorizes this verse, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it's a great verse, the gospel in a nutshell. But if you read the next verse, this is where I want you to hone in on. This is what I want you to focus on this morning. It says this. It says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus didn't come to judge you in his first coming. Jesus didn't come so that he could condemn you or judge you or cast some sort of spell or, or, or some sort of punishment over you. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He came that you might be saved. That's why he walked this earth. That's why he lived his life. That's why he surrendered his holiness. It says that the the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. So I ask you a question this morning. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is the holy son of God who came in the appearance in the form of a man and he humbled himself and went to a cross to die in your place? Because God didn't send his son into the world to condemn you or to make you feel bad. He sent Jesus to save you from your sin, to save you from judgment, to save you from condemnation. That's hope. That's hope. It's an interesting story in John chapter 8. You can read this later. But Jesus goes into the temple and he begins to teach. And imagine this. There he is. He's he's there teaching. People around, he's teaching them God's word. And there in the midst of this time where he's sharing God's word, the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, they come into the midst and they drag a partially clothed woman into his presence and they throw her, her down at his feet. They say to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, in the very act 
We caught her red-handed. We know she's guilty. The law says that she should be stoned and put to death because of her sin. What do you say? Jesus is completely silent. He stoops to the ground. He begins to write in the dirt of the ground. And the religious leaders are relentless. They keep pressing and pressing and pressing. They want an answer. They're trying to trap Jesus. They want him to say, well, I don't, I don't think you should do that, and to somehow go against God's law, go against the law of Moses. They're pressing and they're pressing and they're pressing. He doesn't answer. They keep pressing, they keep pressing, they keep pressing. He's writing in the ground. What do you say? What do we do? She was caught in the act of adultery. He says this, he who is without sin, let them throw the first stone. And he stoops back down and he begins to write in the ground again. And the scripture doesn't tell us what he writes. And there's a lot of different theories. People think that he's writing the name of the religious leaders one by one. And they go out oldest to youngest. And there he is, or, or youngest to oldest. And he's writing down their names. And he's writing next to their names their sin. And every time he does so, another person leaves because they're ashamed of what they've done. They're ashamed because they came into that place of judgment. And they had sin in their lives themselves. Do you follow me? Amen. Jesus writes in the ground... And they're faced with the truth of who they are. And after everyone's gone, and it's just Jesus and the woman left, he looks at her. And there she is, in a broken, shameful state. Ashamed. She's partially clothed. She was caught in the very act of adultery. Completely exposed, completely vulnerable, completely ashamed, stripped away. There, there's, there's no pride left in her. She's broken over her sin. She has no excuse. There's no way she can explain it away. She's guilty, and she knows it, and Jesus knows it. But Jesus looks at that woman, and he says to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Is there no one left to condemn you? Is there no one left to judge you? She says, there's no one, Lord. And listen to this, because this is a word for every single one of you, my friends, here this morning. Jesus looks that woman in the eye, and she, he says this to her. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What does your sin look like? I bet you weren't caught right in the midst of it just like Jesus. Maybe you were, or, or just like this woman in, in the midst of Jesus. Maybe you were. Is there anything, any sin too grave or too big that God, that Jesus can't forgive? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's the charge. That's the call that God has for every single one of us this morning. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I don't condemn you either. There's no one left to bring accusation. There's no one left to judge you. Neither do I condemn you. You go and you start living right. You have a fresh, clean start. You have a clean slate. Just go live the way God has called you to live. I'm not going to judge you because I'm going to pay the price for that sin. Think about that. This is before he went to the cross, and he's looking at this woman in complete ruin, and he says, I don't condemn you. I have every intention of going to that cross in your place. I'll take that. I'll receive that burden. I'll receive that weight. I'll receive that punishment. You don't have to experience it. But see, here's the thing, my friends, is there are two comings of Jesus. There's the first coming and there's the second coming. The first time Jesus comes as a suffering servant. First time Jesus comes as a savior of the world. He comes as the Messiah. He came to give his life, to die in your place. But the second time he comes, he will come as judge. And if you have not surrendered your heart and your life to Jesus by that time, you will be judged by him. And the scripture says that he will be riding a white stallion, a white charger. And out of his mouth will go a sharp sword. And with it, he will strike down the nations. And there'll be a name upon his thigh and upon his way. King of kings and Lord of lords. And you do not want to see that Jesus coming at you. Because at that point, he's coming as judge. But the first time he comes, he comes and he says to you, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. 
When he says, go and sin no more, you understand that that's lingo for you need to repent. You need to turn away from your lifestyle. You need to turn away from your sin. You need to stop being attracted by the old ways. And you need to come in the right direction. You need to come into the presence of God. Go and sin no more. Change your life. I'm not going to judge you, but some things need to change. Now, this scripture, Jesus said clearly this, before you judge, before you cast any judgment on anyone, you shouldn't be judging, but if you're doing, make sure. At the very least, you got to make sure you don't have the same sinful substance in your eye that you're calling somebody else out on, don't you? It says you're judging somebody for having a splinter in their eye, and you've got a two-by-four hanging out of your eye. It's the same. It doesn't make any sense. How can you call someone on the carpet for that sin when you're struggling with the same sin yourself? See, here's the problem with the church today. The church is so weak. The church can't do what Jesus did. Jesus walked the earth and he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn from your old life and turn to God. Repent and get right. Get right and and receive forgiveness and avoid judgment and condemnation. The church can't do that because we've shackled ourselves with sin. How can we go out into the world and say, you need to stop watching pornography? You need to stop being addicted to drugs or to food or to alcohol or to your television shows, your novellas or whatever vice there is in your life. How can we go out and call the world to repentance when the log, the two by four, is hanging out of our own eye? And we've shackled the power of God because of our own holiness or lack thereof. Because we are not righteous. We're not living a righteous and holy life. And it grieves God's heart. See, there's a role that we as the church are supposed to play. And in Galatians chapter 6, it says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. That we're supposed to go to those who are struggling with sin and bring them out of that sin. The scripture says this in James chapter 5, that if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. How can we do that if we're struggling with sin ourselves? You see, Jesus picks that woman up by the hand and he says to her, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. And the reason why he wants her to go and sin no more is so that there's an intimacy with God. So there's a relationship, so that she can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, so that she can walk in new freedom and new life. But if we aren't willing to leave behind the old man, if we're not willing to leave behind the sin and the the shame and the regret and the fear and the doubt, how can we ever make a difference in other people's lives? We're shackled. We're paralyzed. It doesn't have to be so. Jesus said this. He says, you hypocrites. You hypocrites. First remove the beam, the plank sticking out of your own eye before you try to remove the speck from your brother's eye because then you'll be able to see more clearly and you'll be able to address the need more specifically if you remove the beam from your own eye first. 2 Samuel chapter 12, there's a story about David. A David whom God described as a man after his own heart, but he fell wickedly saw a woman bathing on her rooftop and lusted after her and just had to have that woman as his own. So he sent for her and she came and they slept with one another and she becomes pregnant. And the woman's husband is out battling on the battlefield, fighting the fight that David himself as the king should have been fighting. But there he is, your eyes, out fighting the fight that David should be fighting. And so he calls him back from the battlefield and he says, listen, I've called you back. I have some instructions for you, but tonight I just want you to go be with your wife. Uriah goes out and he sleeps on the doorstep of the, of the king's palace because he says, how can I go home and drink and eat and be merry and sleep with my wife when all of my friends and all of my, my coworkers and all my co-laborers are out sleeping in the open fields fighting the fight? So David calls him a second night and he gets him drunk. And he says, now go, be with your wife, enjoy yourself. I'll send you back out to the battlefield soon. Again, he refuses to do such a wicked thing. 
So in desperation, David sends a word to Joab, his general, and he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to send your right to the front of the fight. And when, he, when he's up there at the front, and you're fighting some valiant men, some strong men, what I want you to do is I want you to tell everyone else to retreat and leave him up there by himself. And so guess what happens? He's killed. And David takes his wife Bathsheba as his own to try to cover up the sin of the fact that he had impregnated her. Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, God sends a prophet by the name of Nathan to expose David's sin. And he tells him this story. He says, listen, David, there's a story. There's this guy who's wealthy, and he has herds and herds of sheep. So many, you can't count them. He has no need for any more. And then living nearby is a man who's very poor, and he has just one little lamb. And he treats that lamb like it's his own, like it's one of his daughters. He lets that lamb sleep in the bed with him. He lets that lamb drink out of his own cup. He loves this lamb. And when the, the rich man had a neighbor come visit, he didn't want to take from his own sheepfold and slay a sheep so that he could prepare a meal. He goes and he steals that poor man's one little lamb and prepares it as a meal for his friend, his guest. David is incensed. He's enraged. And he says, as sure as I live, that man will surely die because he did such a wicked thing. And Nathan looks him in the eye and he says, David, you are that man. You have wives and concubines and all kinds of women around you, and he had one wife, and you took her as your own. You are the man. How can you judge that man? You need to look long and hard in the mirror because you are the man. The scripture says this in James chapter 1. It says, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who observes himself in a natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and he immediately forgets what kind of man he is, what kind of man he was. The Bible says that scripture is like a mirror for us. When we read it, it exposes the kind of people we are. It shows us our true nature. It shows us where we're failing. It shows us maybe where we're excelling or exceeding. But it also reveals to us the character of our own heart. When we open it up and we allow it to penetrate our heart, it exposes the things in our life that we need to deal with. When you look in a mirror and you see a piece of broccoli in your teeth, I guarantee you every single one of you is scampering to get it out of your teeth because you don't want people to see that in your smile. But week after week, day after day, we go through our lives and we don't open up the mirror of God's word that exposes the things we need to address spiritually. Now, we might be able to hide those things from one another, but we can't hide them from God. God sees those things. He exposes those things. And if we're going to be able to be used in this world the way God wants us to be used, we have to repent of our sin. There's no way around it. The scripture says this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, For the time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God. You know what? I want judgment to begin in our house this morning, and I want it to begin as we open the word and we expose our own sin. We're not here to judge one another, but we need to judge ourselves, don't we? We need to be honest with where we're at. We need to look in that mirror. We need to say, I have sin. I have lust. I have unforgiveness. I have bitterness. I have anger. I have, I have all of these things that are hindering me from being used by God, and I can't go out and call the world to repentance because I have this cloud hanging over my head. So God, help me to be right. The church needs to remove sin from its midst so we can call our culture to repent today. The church has to stop being apathetic towards sin in our culture. We have to stop being prideful and arrogant and selfish, and we need to get serious about the Lord's work. We need to call people to repentance just like Jesus did. He came upon the scene. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He gave a commission to the church. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, preach the good news, preach the message that neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. I'm not here to judge you, Jesus' words. Jesus doesn't want to judge you. He wants to empower you to live a holy life. His command is to go and sin no more. We need to call our culture to do that. Listen, revival 
will always begin with repentance. Revival cannot begin without repentance. Until the church gets serious about its sin and grieved over its sin and falls down on our faces in a pile of ruin just like the woman who was dragged before Jesus and we're ashamed of our sin like that and we cry out and we say, God, remove this from me, we will not see revival in our borders. Revival, rebirth, revitalization of the church about the holy things of God, those times only happen as a result of repentance. And here's the thing about repentance. Repentance begins with you and with me. There doesn't have to be a huge, incredible, amazing move of God because it happens inside your heart. It happens one of us at a time, each of us at a time. Do we want to see the things of God advance in our culture today? Then we need to start grieving over our sin and judging ourselves. We don't judge one another lest we be judged, but we need to start looking in the mirror. We need to start finding our faults and see what's there. And when repentance comes, the scripture is clear. It says that when repentance comes, we'll be baptized with the Spirit. God will fill and overflow and dwell within us. And then times of refreshing will come according to the book of Acts. We'll be refreshed and people's lives will start being changed. Here's the thing. Today is just as it's always been. Sin separates us from God today just like it always has. And because we've allowed sin in the church, we're separated from God. Jesus tells a parable in Luke chapter 15 about the prodigal son, about a son who is asking for his inheritance now. Dad, give me what I deserve now. Give me my inheritance now. So the dad's grieved, but he gives him the inheritance. And the scripture says that he goes off to a far country. He gets about as far away from his father as he can, and he squanders, he wastes his inheritance, everything that was there for his future. He wastes it with prodigal living, with wasteful living. He wastes it it on partying and on women and on drugs and whatever else you can imagine. He wastes all that the father had stored up for him. And he becomes so desperate and so destitute that he goes to a foreigner in that foreign land and he says, do you have any work for me? And so he sends this Jewish boy out into the fields to tend his swine his pigs. And Jesus says that there in that moment that he looks out and he sees. He sees the pigs and that they're being fed with the leftovers, the scrap heaps, the pods, the leftover food. And he says within his heart, I would gladly fill my belly with just a little bit of what those pigs are eating. That's how bad it got. That's how far his sin had separated him from his father. His father wanted to care for and provide for his every need, but there he is thinking, if only I could eat what the pigs are having for dinner. (coughs) But something happened in his heart. And as he considered that, there he is. If only I could have that food, something clicks, something triggers, and he says, wait a second. I remember how my father treated our slaves. They always had a meal. They always had a roof over their head. Their needs were provided for. Why am I wallowing in this mud? Why am I being separated from my God? Why am I allowing myself to suffer in this sin any longer? I'm going to go back to my father, and I'm going to repent for everything I've done. I'm going to tell him how sorry I am, and I'm going to ask that he'll just take me back as one of the servants. son returns and the father greets him, puts his arm around him, puts upon him the fresh robes, the new ring, the the new shoes, and kills the best, the best of the best because he's going to prepare a meal, a welcome home meal for his son that had wandered away, who had been lost in sin, who had been taken over by sinfulness and had wasted everything. But all it took was for that son to to have that trigger happen in his mind and say, why am I living in the mud with the pigs? Why am I suffering in this sinful state, this pit that I've dug myself into? I'm going to go back to my father. 
And imagine what this religious leader is thinking as he's listening to this story about not judging. He's listening to these words, judge not lest you be judged. His arms are crossed, his teeth are clenched. Already trying to figure out how to cast judgment on everyone in the audience, everyone in the crowd. Jesus says, you need to check. You need to check yourself. You need to check your own eye. You need to look into the mirror of God's word. You need to understand that you're in a sinful place and you're not ready to judge anybody because you've got sin in your own life and it needs to be dealt with and it needs to be dealt with swiftly. And Jesus would say to us this morning, just as he would that woman, he would say, who is there left to condemn you? Our response would be, there's no one, Lord. He would say, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Repent from that sin. Get right so you can be used. Confess it. Lay your heart open before the Lord. Allow yourself to fall at the floor in a heap of ruin and ashes and brokenness and, and disgustingness and see yourself there in that place, grieving over your own sin. And he would say, now you no longer have to live that way. Go sin no more. Are you the religious leader? Are you the one standing at the back of the room with your arms crossed, tearing everybody else down because you're trying to lift yourself up? You can't be that person. You can't lift yourself up. You need to see yourself like the woman who was caught in the act, and you need to understand that the only way you can be lifted up is if Jesus reaches down and grabs you by the hand and he pulls you out of that pit, that miry clay, that feeding of the swine, and he lifts you and he sets your feet on a solid ground and he whispers into your ear, now my child, you understand there's no judgment left. I was judged in your place. Now go and sin no more. Repent and start walking with me. And just as sure as that invitation was there for her, and just as sure as the arms were wide open for the prodigal son, the invitation and the arms are available for you this morning. If you'll step out of that aisle and you'll say, God, that's me. If you'll stop worrying about who's watching, you'll start worrying about the one watching from his throne. You'll say, Lord, I have sin in my heart that I don't want to separate me from you anymore. I'm tired of living in the wallowing mire. I'm tired of living in the mud. I'm tired of being separate. I want intimacy. I want fellowship. I want communion. I want connection. And I want to be back into your presence. All it takes is a move on your part and to say, Lord, that's me. Meet me where I am, Lord, and do a work in my heart. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we aren't bound by an outline. We thank you that we aren't bound by time. Lord, we, we, we invite you now to do your work in our midst. We want to hear from you. We want you to do a work. We want you to call us to repentance. We need you to do it. Lord, it doesn't matter how much I've studied or what I, I, I've done or how much the team is prepared. If your spirit isn't here, if your spirit doesn't move, if your spirit doesn't woo, if your spirit doesn't call and draw us out of the sinful, miry mud, the muck, the filth of this world, God, we have no hope. So, Lord, we pray that you would send your spirit and do a work in our midst this morning. Help us to respond to you and help us to realize and to understand that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That there is no judgment that awaits us, but the freedom, the freedom of going and sinning no more, the freedom of repenting from sin and walking in intimacy and fellowship and communion with you is what our hope is. So, Father, bring us to that place. Lead us into your presence. Do a work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.